Hi, everybody. Welcome into another edition of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, wherever, however, whatever time of day you are listening or watching on the audio side, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, and of course on YouTube, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast page, episode 131. Thank you for joining us today, talking about finding intangibles, plus a bevy of other topics. I hate that word. It's a douchebag word. Let me bring in professional evaluator, successful business owner, former coach, friend, and co-host, Jay Gepstein. Yeah, I uh, I like the word bevy a lot, Jim. I don't yeah. know what you're saying about me. I don't like I don't like bevy. I don't like that word. <laughs> it's it's used by people who are very bougie and people who live in a big house and live in a neighborhood with professional bevy. athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bevies. Yeah, bevies everywhere. Yeah, no, main... good, good to be back. Good to be back. Had a week off because we were in, we were in Vegas for a softball tournament, and uh, luckily we had we had good weather down there. It was a nice trip. Well, that's good. Good, yeah. good, good. You gamble? I missed you. No, I didn't. I didn't. You didn't bet miss one me, dollar. You, you no. Didn't, no, you didn't no, gamble. I my daughter. We stayed. Me. We stayed on the strip. I have my my college roommate um, and really good buddy lives lives down there now. So we got to spend time there but yeah i mean yeah you got kids we went to top golf right behind the strip there that was how fun. is that i've heard good things and they're not a sponsor so we're, we're going to keep it we're going to keep yeah, it short there's so but many how is that fun different golf kind of places it was fun you know it was a little team bonding there were like eight of the girls were there so you know it's good good for them to compete outside of uh softball so yeah you hang out with the parents and golf a yeah little bit? the parents and they serve food and drinks and yeah it's fun they got tvs there so yeah and we're out there trying to score points right you know everybody's competitive in, in youth sports so you know the girls are trying to hit targets and doing something they're not good at so it helps deal with failure we got to deal with failure because oh, yes. they're not good so it actually was a little bit of a learning uh learning lesson as well all right. Very good. Good to have you back. Episode 131 today, Developing Intangibles. I saw this tweet from uh, Jeremy Booth, by the way, former uh, scout for the Seattle Mariners. I found it interesting about, you know, the Astros just made a GM change and um, they have talked about how they've missed the, the Astros. Haven't Jeremy's talked about this too, how the Astros have missed on their first round picks. They've gotten some really good uh, late round picks. Mm-hmm. Certainly Chaz McCormick is one that comes to mind, but um, I don't know if he was a late, late round pick, but nevertheless, um, the, the Astros have missed out a lot on some good first round picks. Some, some guys aren't even playing professional baseball anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and the one thing that he talked about is how analytical people are now saying how pitching to contact or going deeper into games is very, very important as if it's a new idea where baseball men and women prior to that, they were just strictly more baseball oriented valuation oriented rather than analytical are out of the game and now it seems like i don't know it's funny because the we always say how the data and technology revolution and the analytical revolution it will never go away but we will start to swing back i think to the other side and because that's just the life cycle of things in my opinion, especially with, yeah. with baseball. And now too, with the shift going away, I'm not saying that there, there are analytical roles are being diminished, but they're changing a little bit. And it seems like these new ideas, right? These new quote unquote concepts are start are really older concepts that are just recycled. I'm just kind of spewing. <laughs> That's know. exactly what it is. Yeah. I mean, I'll be interested to see looking for pitchers to go deeper in games. I mean, I'm not going to believe that until I see it starting to happen, but you know, as it is now last year, what was it? Five innings. That's, that's uh, kind of the, the max most guys were going, you know, maybe you would touch six. So uh, yeah. And the Astros, again, they, they, it's not like they've had a top 10 pick either. So they, they've had first round picks, but they've also been in the playoffs every single year. So they're getting the, you know, 25th to 30th pick every year. They're not getting the the Orioles picks, which are the you know the top five picks the last few years. So it goes in cycles with with players, and sometimes you miss. But it's a little bit easier when you're picking the top ten prospects overall every year. Those those guys are you know going to have a pretty good chance of making it to the big leagues. You know, I get that. I I will say this though, uh, and I have a list here of the Astros first round picks. Um, in the last since 2000 we'll say since 2011 i have the list Mm -hmm. here but there is one thing i do want to say like i don't understand 
when people say you really nailed that number one overall pick, well, it's easy to nail the number one overall pick, right? It's easy to right. nail. It's easy to nail a top five pick. It's yeah. harder, and this shows you how how hard it is to draft and how hard it is to to scout. And I don't care how many tools you have available to you. Yeah, it shows how hard it is to to scout the right players and to draft the right guys when you draft say fifteen and beyond, fifteenth mm-hmm. and beyond. I mean, it's real. It's really, really hard, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it's and, easy and to I say. Well, you know, we drafted number one and we picked up this guy. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. Rushman, you know, like Alex right. Bregman, for example, right? Yeah. You know, in 2015, he was drafted number two overall. Mm-hmm. That's an easy pick. That's easy mm-hmm. to nail that one. It is. Yeah, and and, and it is. I mean, the Brewers do a pretty good job. I mean, they have a couple first rounders that are going to, you know, you got Freelick and you got Garrett Mitchell that are, you know pretty young through the minor league system and worked their way up and they were kind of higher contact guys, less power guys. They, they play a good defense and those guys are going to see time, you know, this year at the big league level, only maybe three years after the draft. I think this is Freelix. This might be only be two years after the draft or is this his third? Yeah, so, I mean, you have, and, yeah. they, and they've been right around 15 to 20, I think picks pick wise every, you know, the last few years they'll be, they'll have a little bit higher this year, but, yeah, I mean, different teams go after different people. They went after college guys that that had a track record of uh, finding barrels. That that was what they that's what they drafted early. They didn't draft arms early, and some people maybe the Astros drafted arms early, and then you know with that comes risk of injury, uh, burnout, and uh, everybody throws hard now. I mean, I was looking going through my international uh, players the last couple days, and and. You know, the some of the video views I get are great. They're they're live at bats, you know, against pitchers that are, you know, 14, 15. See, you should see these 15 year old pitchers. They're monsters. They're big and strong and polished and they throw hard at a young age. It's like there's a lot of people that that throw. There's yeah. a lot of people that throw hard. And I think that's why a lot of teams go the international route for arms. Or they'll go, um, you know, later on in the draft with arms. You're not seeing a, as many as you used to. You always used to see like the first couple picks were, uh, well, like Jack Leiter, right? Was 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 one. Um, you'd see that every single year. Leiter and Rocker, the the two best college arms, would come out. And now it's uh, not necessarily as as uh, prevalent. I'm always depending on again, and, and there's a lot of context that has to be added to this. But depending on the player development system that you have in place, like for mm-hmm. example, years—I don't know if it's the same now, but a few years ago, the Nationals, their player development system was that of you're going to do it our way. We have everything lined up for you. Bing, bang, boom, right? Mm-hmm. Everything compiled. This is the way you're going to do it, and you're not going to deviate. Other organizations are a little bit more flexible, a little bit more liberal in how they run their player development system with more player input. So if i'm dra- but to me if i'm drafting a pitcher that guy is going to be a high and i have a high round pick a very high first round pick mm-hmm. it's going to be a college pitcher but if not it's going to be a high school pitcher and then i'm going to take a college hitter rather than the high school hitter it's going to be inverted for me mm-hmm. um again it, it, i'm flexible with that approach though mm-hmm. so the astros since 2011 here are their picks george springer carlos correa mark appel who did pitch briefly at the major league level, but considered one of the biggest busts, unfortunately. Although I, I, you give him credit for coming all the way back and getting a chance to pitch for the Phillies this past year. So God bless him for, you know, his comeback and his um, um, tenacity to be able to um, break through everything. Uh, Yeah. Oh yeah. Toughness. Brady Aiken. I mean, you don't hear about him anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Then of course, Bregman at 15, Kyle Tucker from Tampa, Florida plant high school. The same plant high school I complained about with the kids at Crunch Fitness. Or, oh yeah, you know, a couple of a couple of weeks ago, when they all pile in on a on a day off from school. Um, Daz Cameron, who unfortunately I thought he was going to have a great career, but Daz mm-hmm. Cameron, same draft as Kyle Tucker in 2015, he was a 37th overall pick, and he just got outrighted off the Orioles mm-hmm. roster. So, uh, son of Mike Cameron, great athlete. I don't know what happened there. Mm-hmm. Um, Forrest Whitley. Uh, I know what happened. He went to the Tigers player development system and that they ruined him. Uh, Forrest Whitley in 2016. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, JB, um, how do you say his name? 2017 right-handed pitcher from UNC. Hosta or? Uh, okay. ba- Baca- Bacoscus, oh. JB Bacoscus. Seth Beer in 18, Corey Lee in 19. Haven't heard of either one or have. Beer, beer was, uh, 
Beer can hit. I don't know how he's been doing. He played okay. at Clemson. He is with, currently with the uh, with the um, Diamondbacks. Came up, then okay. got optioned last year. <laughs> um, so he's been up and down, nothing really established. And then Corey Lee in 2019. And then, of course, they didn't have a pick in 2020 or 2021 because they cheated. Yeah. Um, so there you go. I, I guess what I'm trying to, to say here, uh, and, and a lot of the, like, Appel was number one. Brady Aiken was one. Kyle Tucker was five. That worked out well. Daz Cameron was 37. Forrest mm-hmm. Whitley, 17. Uh, JB, ba 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 15. Seth Beer was 28. And Corey Lee was 32. I, so I, I understand that point, but yeah. um, to what your point was about, about drafting a little bit later. Um, but, yeah, they, they have not really hit too much the last few years on those first-round picks. And I don't care how late you draft – um, in the in the first round, if you continually miss on those first second round picks, the lifeblood of your organization, the player development system might, is not going to have much to work with, and it's going yeah. to trickle up to the major league level. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They got, uh, but they've done okay for themselves. So they have. No, they've won a world series, <laughs> won a bunch of world series. I get it. I'm just. But there will be a lull, world. right? There, there will be a low a lull in a couple years of not having those those homegrown guys coming through the system like they had with Correa and Bregman and Altuve and Tucker, right? You're going to have a lull in there. They're either going to have to make some trades for, for prospects or, you know, hope for the best. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, Hey, upcoming um, on the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast in the next few weeks, episode 131 today, Finding Intangibles. But we're going to be talking about how pitchers move a hitter's feet, the psychology of that, and how a hitter can counter that. Plus, we're going to be doing some swing breakdowns of Jordan Alvarez, Hank Aaron, Derek Jeter. Man, we've got some good ones coming up. A lot of good topics coming up here in the next year, next six months. So please subscribe to the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Cheers to that, right? We'll drink our coffee together. Mm -hmm. And uh, subscribe to the YouTube page, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast YouTube page to watch the show. All right, I'm bringing up a tweet here that you tweeted a couple of uh, days ago. We record this on a Saturday. The episode comes out on a Monday. Um, And you tweeted February 10th, actually. Ever wonder why you, quote-unquote, just miss good pitches? This could be the reason. And you link that to a YouTube video that you have. So let's talk about that a little bit, shall we? Why do you miss good pitches as a hitter? Yeah, you know, sometimes you you feel like, geez, I'm right on that. I'm, I'm right on it. Why did I foul that straight back? Why did I just get under it? Um, usually if you roll over it, that's not considered a just miss, right? Like I didn't just miss that. Now I might have players say, God, I felt like I was right on it. And it's just a two hopper to the short stuff. I, I don't know what's going on. So that's always, always a swing plane issue. Um, and it's very, very common. It's very common with players that lose the barrel a little bit early. Um, whether it's their top hand opening up, whether it's their hands dropping a little bit, whether it's the knob, you know, starting down and then, violently pulling back up which which causes a big scallop in the swing and in the barrel a few frames later so um yeah it was just everybody's been there um i remember i had a player when i first started teaching 20 20 years ago i had a player a really good player he played trying to think where he played i think he played at u of a in college and then he played in the diamondbacks organization for probably eight years you know triple a i think he got some big league camp stuff but a really good solid player and he would always just foul ball straight back. So he'd be he'd be super hot, and then all of a sudden, boom, fouling him straight back, fouling him straight back. And then he would call me and be like, "Hey, up, I'm I'm fouling him straight back again." And I'd be like, "Okay, you need to." So his was different. His wasn't a barrel drop. His was just almost like a hand drop right at launch or a vision thing. He may have had a vision issue. Actually, come to think of it, you know, twenty years later. But he would be on it, but under. And so the fix was simply swing over the top of the ball. like, And, and whatever that cue did for him, it made him keep his hands up maybe a, a little bit longer. It wasn't like he needed to keep his barrel up. It was just his whole swing plane was too low. It, it was, But it was a good swing plane. It was very flat. So everyone's a little bit different. The one in that video that I showed uh, on YouTube or, or Twitter, it was, I mean, he launched this ball you know, a million miles in the air. I think it was like a 45 degree launch angle or something like that. And his eye hand coordination and timing was so perfect, but with video, you can really spell it out. You can see the, 
the swing, you know, the pitch plane or so was coming in at, I don't know, probably seven, eight degrees. And he was swinging up at like 25 degrees at point of contact because he had lost his barrel early and then he had to correct it and he had to get his barrel back up. And a lot of times when we do that, then we swing up way too much out in front, but he was still able to get to the bottom half of the ball and hence he just skied it out. So he kept telling me, I'm just missing these. I don't know what's going on. I'm hitting the highest fly balls to left field, which is usually a pretty good sign, except that when you take the video back, if he was one ball late, if he was three inches late, he would have missed the pitch completely. And if you're only on plane for a, a three to four inch window, you're not going to have very good success. So, uh, yeah, it's very timely. You know, people, I, I heard from a lot of people I haven't heard from in a while, which is which is kind of weird um, with that, you know, posting that because it's just, it's a very common move. And it's, um, you know, part of the issue when we train is, and I'm sorry to keep going on here, but, you know, we train, at least when I look on, on, on Twitter and Instagram, everything's off of a T, you know? Yeah. It's like, I'm old and I got a bum ankle and a bad knee, and I can look great off a of tee. Mm-hmm. You know, I can do whatever I want to off a of tee. I can do whatever I want to off front toss. But as soon as that ball moves a little bit, it doesn't even have to move a lot. I mean, it can be a a, a, a small hack attack machine throwing at five or six degree drop, you know, from 35 feet, you know, like, a, like an 80 mile an hour pitch. You know, that's a strike every time. That's when everybody falls apart, and that's when players get exposed. So, um, the one thing I, I listened to a nice, nice webinar yesterday with Jason Ochart at um, Driveline. You know, he's a Driveline guy. He was the Phillies coordinator. I think he's doing some with the Red Sox now. I mean, he's a really sharp guy. And, you know, they try to teach and work with their players in a more of a live setting. You know, there's there's some front toss and there's some T work, but it's like, you know, we're not just trying to, you know drop and drive kind of now, stuff. Now, is this chaos know? training? Let's let's be clear about that. I wouldn't that. consider it chaos training. No, I okay. wouldn't consider it chaos training. But it's mm-hmm. – um, anyway, you, you really don't know what kind of player you have until you get them off of a moving object. Right. And so just be cautious. I use the T a ton. A lot, of, a lot of teams and organizations don't use the T at all. The T has a purpose. And when you're changing players and you're trying to get players from one level to the next because they have a mechanical flaw – you can't just go straight to, I mean, if they're 24 years old, um, you know, I had a minor leaguer in recently that was, um, you know, didn't have the greatest year last year. Yeah. And so he told me what was going on and then he had some game video and then in 10 minutes, we worked it out. 10 minutes, maybe even five minutes. Here's the field. Do this, do this, do this. Oh my God, this is so great. It feels awesome, right? Well, if the kid's 12 years old, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be a slow process. I had a new player in the online academy start. I think he's nine and he's a little stud. He's from Louisiana and he's, he like works his little tail off, but he was doing his drills and I'm like, okay, we're making progress with the drills. But then after he did his drills, he went in and started taking live batting practice, you know, 10 minutes after that. And then they sent me the video, of course. And I'm like, well, everything you worked on with the T got flushed down the toilet. Cause you just took 20 swings off of a machine or off dad throwing to you and everything broke down. So when you're working with young players, you have to layer it. You have to use it to, you have to isolate this. You have to isolate that. That's why the, you know, without blowing the horn on the Epstein teaching system that my dad started years ago, that's why it works. The inf- the inf- yeah, the information's great and we have a ton of experience, but it's the process in which we implement the information to said player, whether it's a 20, this was a 21 and 20 year old professional player and a, an eight year old, uh, you know, young guy. I don't, I think yeah. he's, he might be playing travel ball, right. Or just league ball at eight. Wow. At eight or nine. Yeah. I mean, he's a good little athlete, but it's like, we're giving them the same information. We're just doing it in different ways. So I don't know how we got onto that topic. No, I'm glad what, you blew the horn, though. You, what we were, yeah. I don't know what we originally were talking about, but missing good pitches. Oh, it was missing good pitches, but that's yeah. where it starts with. You know, it starts with having a good swing plan. I think we're talking about hand path maybe next week, which is you just spoiled it for everybody. Yeah, gonna, just, that's no, I want them to think about how important it is because hand path that's, will get rid of the hole in the swing. That's the audience. Um, that's their homework this week. Yeah, we're giving our audience homework. That's Homework. a good way to get good way get to get questions for sw- for hand path. Yeah, email us Jimbo Podcast twenty one at 
at gmail.com. And by the way, if you'd like to subscribe to um, our newsletters too, email us as well, Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. Yeah. This week on Cross Functionality, Cassie and I, Cassie Riley Bosha and I, softball national champion at the University of Alabama. Her and I are the same age, by the way. Jeff, uh, Jake and I, roll tide. Jake and I are not. Jake is older than me. He's a, as I've said before, mentor and coach. Um, we are not the same age, although. Um, my maturity level, people do say I'm like in my 40s. I'm not saying Jake's in his 40s, but I'm not saying, I'm not saying Jake acts like he's in his 20s. <laughs> I, I didn't say that either. I didn't allude Maybe to that okay. either. I'm I'm talking about how I'm mature. You are how, how I am mature for my my age. So it was Cassie though, and Cassie and I talked about the I've uh, subscribed to cross functionality, by the way, um, on um Apple, Google, Spotify, and I could say that now in my sleep, by the way. You're not even yeah, paying man. attention to me. You You're not even paying do. attention. Wait, yeah. what are you looking at over there? Your I was dog? Wandering, you... I was wondering. I'm getting old. You told me I'm old. I just That's good. Off. I'm glad you're wandering. My 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 partner here is I had wandering. An my creative, I had my creative an partner is wandering. Studio. He's he's dozing off. So that's good. That's a good sign. I'm sure the audience is dozing off as well. Mental side of hitting. That's what Cassie and I talked about. And there's so much there. We could talk for like three hours about it. About mental side of hitting. But it always always comes down, and this is like one of the, the themes, the spine of this show, having an approach and having a plan, going up there with an approach and a plan that helps you mentally at the plate. Mm -hmm. True. What do you got for me? <laughs> I don't know. I was dozing. No, I'm just kidding. You were. I know. I was going to lead it into intangibles. I mean, you weren't paying be, attention. That's kind of an intangible. Um, yeah. Having having the right mindset, they're just. It, it's hard. You know, you can teach mindset, you can teach relaxation, you can teach players to essentially have a slow heart rate, but some do and some don't. And that's something that usually doesn't show up on a data chart. You know, it usually doesn't show up on a, on a scouting report that is um, compiled with a computer, you know, meaning exit velocity, launch angle, speed, quickness, agility, strength, right? This is the this is the part that kind of puts it all together. Um, I always go back to Manny Ramirez, you know, he, who was such a, I, I don't even know what he was. Um, he was a, just an amazing player. He was an amazing hitter. I mean, my one of my favorite highlights of all time is when he catches the ball short of the outfield fence, kind of jumps up the wall, gives somebody a high five. This was in Camden Yards, I believe. Yeah. So he catches the ball. Or they move the wall back. Yes. He catches the ball like a step short, like full speed. He kind of jumps up the wall, gives somebody a high five, turns around, and throws the ball back into the infield. I don't think that was scripted, right? This was no. somebody that's in such a relaxed state of mind, having fun on the ball field. It's not that he was a great defensive outfielder. It probably drove his, his manager crazy. But, you know, he had that. When you looked at him in the box, there was no stress. Why was he such a great clutch hitter? No stress. Like the world doesn't end if I make an out here, right? It's going to keep spinning. If I make an air, it's going to be okay. I'm going to fall asleep. I'm going to wake up the next day. And that mindset is very hard to get through to players. And maybe just maybe some of those Astros first round picks, that's where their deficiency was. Maybe it wasn't how good they swung the bat or how fast they ran or what kind of glove they had. Maybe it was what was between the ears. And that I, um, usually is is what kills players um, at that level more than any kind of ability factor. May I just counter with something? No. Okay. I have to counter with something. Okay. So there's a guy who just retired that played here in Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. You may know him. Maybe not. I don't know. Tom Brady. In my opinion, the greatest quarterback of all time. Some people say Joe Montana. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um Tom Brady, best quarterback of all time. You mentioned that mindset with Manny Ramirez, having that relaxed mindset of, well, if I make an error, the world doesn't end, right? Mm -hmm. It's fine, but it, Tom Brady doesn't have that mindset. If he throws an interception, guess what? He, he's throwing that tablet too, or he's yelling at mm -hmm. his offensive line. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem to have that mindset. All right, I know the sports are different. I get it. But these are two top athletes we're talking about here, Tom Brady, Manny Ramirez. Manny Ramirez... Again, it was a very relaxed state, but doesn't that, mm -hmm. if you constantly have that attitude of, well, if I make an error, if I strike out, the world doesn't end. If you have that attitude, that's okay, Okay, fine. You keep yourself relaxed, but doesn't that invite complacency? No, well, it could. Yeah, yeah, it could. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, Tom Brady's, you know, he's in control of what he's doing. It's a little bit different. Than but Manny baseball. was too. That's what's. That's where the... No, but we're not in control in the batter's box. We're Crossing. reaction. We're reactionary. On defense, mentally, I'm talking about. I'm talking about mentally. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, how many interceptions did Tom Brady throw? Right? He probably threw a lot. Right. I get it. I'm yeah. just, you know. Yeah, like... Uh, he's a perfectionist. That's a different, that's a, that's a way different personality type, a personality, you know, kind of running the running. Uh, you could, you could maybe have Jeter and, and Brady, you know, maybe that, okay, guy. but yeah. Jeter was the same way. Like he, you know, Jeter made outs, you know, we failed. Tom Brady's never going to throw more incompletions than completions. He's never going to throw more interceptions than touchdowns. Right. In baseball, we're going to strike out a lot more than we get hits. So right. it's it's a hard comparison. But um, uh, all right. I'm just saying. I yeah. Know, my point no, was I the mean, complacency yeah. part. Yeah. Complacency. Yes. That, well, you're not going to make it right. If you're too complacent and it and you you don't care about what you're doing, then you're gone. But for someone to, to succeed at that level, you have to have obviously a combination of of um, work ethic and desire and pride. But with this game, um, like golf as well, you know, you, you can't dwell on the negative. I guess that's the best way to put it. All right. Well, be sure to watch cross functionality, softball strength Academy, YouTube page, listen to the show, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Again, this week, Cassie and I talked about the mental side of hitting. So go ahead and, um, listen and get her opinion on that and uh, the mental side and, um, all of the great information. So subscribe and listen to the show. Thank you very much. Let's get to our listener question. We do have a listener question. It was not sent to us via Jimbo Podcast 21 at gmail.com. It was sent to us via our YouTube page, a comment on one of our videos from the same guy who de doesn't uh, brought up the steak or whatever, the marinating in the steak. I did marinate chicken this week, by the way. <laughs> oh, no, it was, not was again. Great. It was delicious, the chicken yes. that I marinated. I did. Ma I marinated. For the, for the Super Bowl, I'm going to smoke some strip steaks, some New York strips. Yeah. Not going to marinate them, and then we're going to pour some chimichurri on the top of them. Let it soak that in at the end. Right. Why not just barbecue sauce? No, and I can't put barbecue sauce on good steaks. Why not? He's going to comment put, again on this, too. So I hope he doesn't. I, I don't put it really. On pork. Put on chicken. No, no. You can put it. Well, you, you can put it on, on steak, too. Yeah. Google it. I'm not saying I do it all the time. <laughs> I did marinate a grass-fed steak this week, though. Yeah, that you may have to do. The grass grass-fed has a little different flavor to it because oh, grass-fed is good, though it really is. Um, so uh, he he says on he did comment about something about okay, it. yeah. What is the question? So I'll get to the question instead. Uh, on a baseball yeah. note, he said uh, this is from Da, by the way, the guy okay. um, who commented. On YouTube, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast YouTube page. I'd be interested in hearing how you quantify, this is for you, Jay. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in hearing how you would quantify a quality at bat, say for a youth player 13 to 15. So I'm guessing DA has a, has a mm -hmm. kid who's 13 or between 13 and 15. This is a great question. Is mm -hmm. that something you even track? So again, how do you quantify a quality at bat for a youth player 13 to 15? Is that something that you could even track? Great question from DA sent to us via our... Um, YouTube yeah. page. I got the um, episode 130 actually on my screen right now as I'm looking at you, and we look great. Oh, good, good. We look great here. All right, so what's what do you got? Yeah, I, I think you can. I, I I always. Well, how do you do I mean, that? I, I might not, you know, have my folder, you know, with all the information about good at bats, but I always have notes. Mm -hmm. I have notes, you know, with 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 my own kid that we can refer to days later you know kind of we could walk through again if if she's open to it i'm not going to force that <laughs> because it, a wall could go up really quick but yeah. hey let's let's walk let's walk through the at bats um for instance if if that player came up to bat and uh the first player of the inning you know made an out on the first two pitches uh, or the first pitch something like that and then you know, your son or daughter goes up and swings at the first pitch. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whether she puts it in play or not. Okay. That's a learning experience. So I don't know if I'd call them quality at bats, but I'd call that a learning experience. Okay. We probably shouldn't have swung at that first pitch, right? We don't want that pitcher to get out of the inning early. Um, depending on what part of the game it is, you know, that's big too. Maybe there's runners in scoring position. Um, 
I, I might want to be more aggressive. So a quality at bat in terms of seeing a lot of pitches, I'm not going to see a lot of pitches. I got runners in scoring position. I may only get one good pitch to hit. I'm ready to rock and roll on, on the first pitch. Maybe it's later in the game I'm hitting leadoff and the pitcher or I'm hitting second and the pitcher is not throwing very, very many strikes. You know, maybe I'm taking a strike in that situation because we're down by one or two runs and I'm, we need base runners here in the last inning. So quality at bats for me change based on the situation of the game. And I want players to start thinking about that. I, I want them to learn so I don't have to tell them before they're in a bat. Hey, we're down by two runs. We need base runners. Don't swing at the first pitch. Okay. Like I don't want to have to say that. Coaching so yourself. We, right. Yeah. You know, if we talk about this after the game, if we talk about it um, in meetings, then they'll, they'll start to learn on their own. Um, but if we never tell them, they're never going to learn. So um, I, I definitely wouldn't at, at that age, 13 to 15, I'm not quantifying a quality of bat by pitches seen. Um, I'm probably quantifying the bat on pitches swung at. Did we stay inside the zone early in the count? Okay. Were we looking for hittable pitches early in the count? That's number one. Number two, were we aggressive on those pitches or were we feeling for them? I have players that I, I work with and see, and they're very aggressive in practice, but in a game situation, they feel for balls, whether it's on the outside corner or it's down the middle, they're feeling for the ball uh, with less than two strikes, okay? So that's not a quality of bat or a quality approach. So um, I guess we could take everything into consideration, but the simple answer would be um, chart the at bat if you would like, you know, if you're, if you're, if your kid is, is, is up for that chart it and, and give the two cents on it. What were you thinking here? You know, go back to that at bat a day later and say, what was the situation? Do you remember the situation? Okay. Or did you just walk up to the plate blind? I'm going to hit the ball. Okay. Well, usually it's, I don't know. I just kind of walk up to the plate. So I you think have 13, to 15 is they're that, more, more adept to walk up to the plate blindly than not. Correct. Yeah. If you're in that 13 year age, they're probably just walking up the plate, but I still want them to think about it. Okay. I still want them to know because by the time they're 15, they do need to have that. They need to have a, a little bit of a plan an idea of what's happening, what the game situation is before they get into the box. So uh, quality of bat would be, you know, on a very, very basic level at, at age 13, 14, you know, 15, you can get more advanced is were you aggressive on strikes in the strike zone early in the count with less than two strikes, or did you take pit? Did you take too many pitches? That would not be a quality of bat. Did you swing at pitches outside the zone with less than two strikes when you were ahead in the count? That would be a ding against the quality of bat. Or did you stay within your zone and you stayed aggressive? Boom. Those are two things that you can really quantify in an easy, quick way and share that with your player. Thinking, I wrote something down here. Um, maybe that should be an, an upcoming topic for an episode. Yeah. Quality of bats at each level. Quantifying quality of bats at each level. Yeah. Write that down. At age nine, don't get hurt. Have fun, right? Have fun. That's exactly right. So that you're still playing at age 12 and 13. All right. So that's going to be an upcoming topic this year. I hope we answered DA's question. I think we did. There's something in there, DA. Email us, jimbopodcast21 <laughs> at gmail.com if anybody has any questions. Also, um, you can just, re you're listening on the podcast side, audio, you can just, you know, reverse it, right? 30 seconds, rewind, so. It's got to be, there's something in there. And if you miss it, you can just rewind. That's the good so, thing about podcasting. That's why it's, you know, better than radio because you can just rewind. That's right. I don't have to continually recap what we're talking about, which is good. Um, episode 131, Developing Intangibles, as I recap today's episode, uh, today's topic, or uh, sorry, Finding Intangibles. I got to mm -hmm. get it correct. Finding Intangibles. Um, get into our topic here. Subscribe to the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you get your shows and whatnot. Leave a review, star us, whatever. Um, finding intangibles um, with hitters, with players, a little more complicated than you think. Um, but recognizing intangibles in a hitter. What are your thoughts on that? Thought process and trying to recognize those intangibles in a hitter. That's where good scouts come from. That's where those yeah. old experienced scouts, even if it's one thing, even if they don't care about exit velocity and uh, launch angle and direction and whatever, they will pick up intangible. How a guy moves, what kind of jumps they get on fly balls, 
Um, do they anticipate where the where the ball is going to be hit before it's hit? You know, based on pitch selection. So a lot of times you can say this this outfielder has great instincts, okay, or an infielder has great instincts. They they have the ability to get a jump quicker, you know, two tenths of a second quicker than the average player. Okay, well, how do they do that? Right, that's that's an intangible. How do we find that? Well, maybe it has to do with their their cognitive um, ability, how they interpret. You know, they they see the information with their eyes. How quickly it goes from eyes to brain to feet to get a good jump. Okay, so that's part of it. That's something you can sometimes work on, but cognitive stuff is is tough. And, and hitting is the same way. You know, we're, we're seeing information. What what a lot of people don't understand is the the feet. That that's the first thing we do. Um, you know, non, non pitcher or maybe pitcher too. I'm not a big pitching guy, as you might know from the term Epstein hitting, uh, the company. and the title of the show, <laughs> but, but if you're fielding, it's not eye hand coordination first, it's how quickly you see the information. It goes to your brain. And then we move our feet in the batter's box is the same thing. Our feet are going before that ball is even coming out of the hand. Then how quickly can we interpret, you know, ball spin release point strike to get our foot down in time. Okay, so th these are things that um, are, are intangibles. Maybe a center fielder that gets great jumps. Maybe before the ball reaches home plate, they're they're seeing that that ball's cutting away. They know that maybe they can't see the sign, you know, all the way from center field what the pitch is, but they can see the shape of the pitch and they can see maybe that it's running inside to this hitter, and they just kind of get a little bit more weight on their on their right foot to move to the pole side or whatever it is. Those are intangibles. And, and those are seen, I played with guys like that and you just understand how do they consistently get better jumps? How do they mm -hmm. consistently make those tough plays? And it's not like we hit a lot of balls in the gap and made players dive for it. You know, they just, they were a step quicker to everything. So seeing that at the scouting level and then harvesting that, you know, getting that player, testing them, getting jumps, you know, bringing out what they might do better than, than other people is, is, is really important. So, you know, that's one of them. We talked a little bit about, you know, Manny Ramirez and maybe, you know, he's, you know, just kind of chills out, right? right? He's got a slow heart rate, but when he gets in the box, my goodness, is he a sharp guy? I mean, he is, he knows what pitch he's looking for. He knows what pitch he's, if it's outside that window or outside that tunnel that he's looking for or outside the shape that he's looking for, he has the ability to to stick with that plan and to trust that plan. That's an intangible. I have a lot of players where I say, okay, we're sitting on fastballs here. We're sitting on fastballs that counts one and oh, you know, you're 14 or 15 years old. If anything is different, we're going to take it. If you see a different spin, if you see different speed, if you see a different release point, if I drop down sidearm, if I choke the ball and it squirts out of my hand sideways like a changeup. I don't care what it is. You don't have to know what it is. You just have to know that it's different than the fastball that you're hunting. Do you have the ability to take it? Do you have the ability to abort that swing? And so many players don't, but we can practice it. We can help that player, but some players are going to be better than others just because they see things a little bit different. They have better vision. That would be an intangible. They have better depth perception. That would be an intangible. Players that don't have as good a vision, you know, they're going to be um, they're going to be in the dark, so to speak, when when it gets nasty out there. So, um, from experience, my dad had bad vision. I have bad vision. My poor kid has bad vision. And make sure if you don't have twenty fifteen vision that you try to get 2015 vision okay and there's a lot of major leaguers that see 2025 that that got lasik and now see 2015 so when you go to the eye doctor learning lesson for your parents and you, and you as players go to the eye doctor find a specialist that will tweak and tweak and tweak even if you have almost perfect vision have them put a light lens on wear a pair of you know light oakley shields that Maybe don't seem like they do much, but maybe it gets you from 2020 to 2018. Maybe you have a split second longer. You can see the ball, whatever it is. But those intangibles, you, know, you could call them God-given, right? Or And this isn't a religious show or whatever, given from birth from your, your parents. But well, we're both the, Catholic, so whatever. They're, they're special. Yeah, they're, they're special things that maybe our player development department can't help you with. You know, we can't 
we can't build that. We can't say, oh, I want you to get a better jump. We can teach you how to get a better jump. We can right. teach you the mental process of thinking your way through this. Okay. I mean, every outfielder has a card, right? Or this guy tendency to pull the ball early in the count. Okay. So maybe I'm kind of leaning that way and I'm cheating a little bit, but to have the ability, you know, to, to see the ball run, to see if the, the hitter was maybe a little bit early with his stride and to be able to cheat that to that direction instinctively, that would be an intangible. And we just want to harvest that. We want to let that player run with it. But there's a lot of players that have intangibles and things we can't control that'll be big leaguers. And there's a lot of players that have amazing mechanics and amazing physiques and amazing vision. But if they don't have the right mental aspect and they get stressed out, those players never make it to the big league level. And that's why player development and scouting is so difficult. Now, before we wrap up today's episode of finding intangibles and hitters, are there any intangibles mechanically for hmm. a hitter that they need that makes them successful, if any? And no, I'm not counting my four pillars of hitting. Although approach, having that approach, that's kind of an intangible. It right, is. Mentally. It is, but that's not mechanical. Right, so, right, right. You know, if we, you know, as far as mechanics are concerned, possibly flexibility. Okay. Um, physically, phys physical flexibility, not not just mentally, right? Yes, physically, physical, almost like where you can have control over your body, where you can move, you know, quick so and good tight mobility with flexibility. So it could be yeah. something that's trained with with strength and performance. But you know what, Mike Trout moves like. He moves real fast. You know, there's a lot of guys that are that size, and he's not, you know, super huge. Like he and Otani are totally different bodies. But Trout, even though he's so stocky and tight, his separate, like he turns so quick and efficiently that it's, I, I you couldn't tell Otani to do that same thing because mm -hmm. Otani is going to be looser and he's going to have more hip separation. Okay. But that hip separation, it's not necessarily how much that hip se separation happens. It's how, how tight it is, how, how quickly the hips open and then boom, it snaps the upper body through. So I would definitely say, you know, mechanically somebody like Trout would be quicker, quicker to the ball because of his build and his athleticism. Um, if you could call that an intangible, I, I'm, I'm not real sure, but that would probably be the only thing there. There are hand path moves. You know, why do some guys have really good hands? You know, I can I can teach the right hand path, but why do some guys just do it naturally? Is I that like an intangible? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's an I can teach everybody the right move, but can they do that move quickly and can they do that move in a stressful environment? Maybe that's what makes it intangible. And then we just don't know. That's that's my job as a coach. Your job as a coach and a parent is to to give the player the right information, whether they're they're eight years old or 25 years old, and then what can they do with that information? What can they do with those moves? And and that's all we can do as coaches. That's our job is to, to foster good information, to give them an environment to succeed, and then to let them take it as far as as far as they can and in hopes that they love it and enjoy it. All right. Well, next week, speaking of hands, since we'll be talking about bat and hand path next week. What the fuck you doing? <laughs> hands. <laughs> bat and hand path next week. I just look like a torso sitting on the computer screen. I wanted people to know I had hands. I don't think I don't think that they were thinking about that, especially if they're not watching. <laughs> Good point. They can see your Brewer shirt. Though. By the way, later in the year, I mentioned earlier about the upcoming topics. Later in the year, we're going to be talking about some draft picks and doing some breakdowns of some some hitters that you are probably looking at and evaluating for uh, Milwaukee right now for your your organization. So we will be doing that later in the year. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I have to be very quiet with my comments on those. Right now, I, yes. I will say your boy Sal's playing for Team Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh okay, hold on. Free lick. I'm pretty that. sure he's gonna play on the uh world baseball classic team Italy. You uh are you going to watch that? The world baseball classic? Yeah, of course. It's baseball. Really? Yeah. Right. Uh okay, yes. This is according to a report uh from rotoballer.com. Oh. Sal Freelich expected to play for Italy in the World Baseball Classic. That was oh. uh six days ago. Yeah, very good. 
It's getting a head start, baby. Some live at bats before spring training. I'm not. Uh, you think he makes the big league club this year? At some point. I'm not going to be watching. Probably not watching much of the World Baseball Classic. Yeah. Nah, not much. What else? Is, what's better? There's no football on anymore. You're going to watch NCAA college basketball. The, spring training and, and, and the NCAA tournament. I'd rather yeah, watch that. that. The World Baseball Classic is just kind of like, hey, let's go out there and you know play some baseball. Okay, well, I'll, I'll wait till. April and when the games really count. <laughs> College baseball starts in a week. College, College baseball started yesterday. Yeah. So, yeah, there's plenty that's going to be on TV. Um, all right. So, next week, um, Bat and Hand Path, episode 132. Subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, do what you got to do. Thank you for listening, watching, and we'll talk to you.